Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, and I'll be reading verses 12 through 19. And this is what it says. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold your king comes, sitting on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. And so the multitude who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing witness to him. For this cause also the multitude went and met him, because they heard that he had performed this sign. The Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this great day of celebration. In all of it, may it point to you. And Lord, in all of it, give us eyes that see and ears that hear that we, we might understand, that we might hear, that we might see. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was just about a week ago, just about a week ago, that Jesus and his disciples were beyond the Jordan. That's what the Bible says, they were beyond the Jordan. We don't know where beyond the Jordan was, but beyond the Jordan, that's code they were out in the boondocks. They were in the middle of nowhere when they got word that Lazarus was sick. Well, Lazarus lived in Bethany. Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was anything but the boondocks. Well, from, by the time they got from the boondocks to Bethany, Lazarus wasn't sick anymore. He was dead. He'd been dead for four days. Oh, and his sister Martha, she unloaded on Jesus. She said, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Jesus went to the, the grave of Lazarus. And there at the grave, the Bible tells us, Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. And I believe it's the most pastoral verse in the whole Bible as well. Because in those two words, Jesus wept, it lets us know that that your suffering, it matters to God. That your pain, it matters to God. Your heartache, it matters to God. And so Jesus wept. But that's not all Jesus did. Jesus asked for the, the stone to be rolled away. And when he asked for the, the stone of Lazarus' grave to be rolled away, he shouted down death. He said, Lazarus, come out. And death let go of its grip and out walked Lazarus, four days dead in the grave. Now, you raise somebody who's been dead for four days, 
people are going to talk. Oh, word, it spread like, like wildfire. If they didn't know Jesus by face, they certainly knew him by name. If they didn't know the first disciple, they knew Jesus by name. He raised Lazarus, four days dead in the grave. Well, after being dead for four days, you can bet he was hungry, and it's time for a party, a time for celebration. And that's just what they did at Lazarus' house there in, in Bethany. They were gathered around, and that's when Mary, his other sister, that's when she did it. She brought a, a vial of perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' head and on Jesus' feet. Now, this wasn't just a, a little bit of, of sweet-smelling stuff for a date night. No, this, this was perfume made to overpower the stench of death. This wasn't just a, a little bit of sweetness. This is sweetness that people could, could smell from, from many feet away. So the next day, when the week of the Passover began and, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem, not only could they identify him by name, not only could they identify him by smell, now they would put the face and the name and the smell all together as he rode in on a donkey. This feast of the Passover, it was the greatest feast of the whole year. And it's estimated more than two million people would have been pushing into Jerusalem and the two little towns of Bethany and Bethphage right outside. And as they, they, they pushed in, as they, as they pushed in, they'd break off branches from, from trees and palm branches. They, they saw the face of Jesus. They heard the name of Jesus, and they began to, to wave the branches. Matthew says they even pulled off their clothes and laid them in the street. And they began to shout, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna is not the same as hooray or whoopee. Hosanna means save us. And they went on to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They were calling him a king. They were calling him a king. And then in verse 16, it tells us this, that as Jesus rode in on a donkey, while people were calling him king, waving the palm branches, it says, these things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. At first, they didn't understand. It was after Jesus rose from the grave. After Jesus rose from the grave, then they understood. Well, what did they understand? What did they understand? That's what I want to talk about this morning. That's what I want to talk about this morning. The first thing that I want to talk about is they understood that Jesus has power over death. Jesus has power over death. James Moore tells a story about a, a father, excuse me, a, a a husband, a husband who had just buried his, his wife, his young wife, and he and his young son were coming from the cemetery when the young boy began to, to ask his father questions. Daddy, when will mommy be home? Daddy, where is mommy? Well, his father tried to answer the questions as best he could. But the boy still kept with his, his young and innocent questions. That night, as he put his son to bed, he didn't want to leave him in the night alone, so he laid down next to him. And the questions began again. Daddy, where is Mommy? When will she be home? And the father did the best to answer him as he, he laid next to his son. And that's when... The little boy said, Daddy, if you turn your face toward me, I think I can go to sleep now. The father turned toward his son, and, and by his, his breathing, he could tell that he was drifting off to sleep. And that's when the father whispered a prayer. Oh, God, these days in front of us are dark, and I don't understand them, but I know if you turn your face toward me, 
will get through. When Jesus was at the grave of his friend Lazarus, and he shouted down death, he turned his face toward, toward you and toward me. When on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. He defeated sin and death. He turned his face toward you and toward me. When he rose from the grave and he said, receive the Holy Spirit, he turned his face toward, toward you and toward me. That in receiving his Spirit, that we also received his power, his power over death, that death no longer has a sting, that death's power no longer controls us, that the power, the power of the risen Christ is a power that changed everything for, for you and for me. And the power, that power, the power of His Holy Spirit is available to you and me, not one day, but this day. It's available to us this day. That Jesus has power over death. The disciples, the disciples, they, after His resurrection, they began to understand that, that power available to them. Not only the power over death, but they began to understand because of his resurrection, that Jesus gives power through life. Case could be made that if, if, if the Bible were, were reduced to one theme, that theme would be life. Life. That God said you have life and death before you. That when, when God breathed into, and this is Genesis chapter 2, when God breathed into to Adam's nostrils, he breathed in the breath of life, is what the Scripture tells us. And that, 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 that breath of God, that breath of God was breathed into Adam and he became a living being. When the Spirit of God entered into Adam, the breath of God entered into Adam, that's when he became a living being. And that's what makes us fully human, the Spirit of God within us. So when, when Jesus rose from the grave, John tells us in chapter 20 that he breathed on his disciples. That he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 20, verse 21, John says, These things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life. In his name. Jesus came that you and I might have life. That life that has the quality of eternity. A life that's full and abundant. A life where his spirit lives through us here, now, this day. Earl Palmer wrote a, a little book called The Enormous Exception. And in that book... He's interviewing a, a young man who is a pre-med student at the University of California, Berkeley. This young man has gone through a, a long journey, a journey with a lot of questions and a lot of doubting. And when he came through that journey, he became a Christian. Well, Earl Palmer is interviewing this young man. And the young man says, the tipping point for me, the tipping point for me in becoming a Christian was when I was a student at University of California, Berkeley. He said, I, I was sick, and I had missed 10 days straight of class. But there was this other guy in the class. And that every day after class, without fuss or complaining or fanfare, he would bring me the notes. He would explain to me what went on in class that day. And he would even study with me so I wouldn't fall behind in those 10 days that I missed class. And then the young man goes on to say this. He says, this kind of thing just isn't done. I wanted to know what made this guy act the way he did. I even found myself asking if I could go to church with him.
if you were the only Jesus that people came across, would it be enough to tip the scales? Would it be enough to, to tip the scales? Would it make a difference? Would they be able to see in, in you the life of the risen Christ? Would they be able to see a life, a life that was full and abundant, a life that was different? Would they be able to see in you a life that has purpose, in service of God and others. This is the life that Jesus gives to, to you and me. A life not that just serves ourselves, but a life in love with God that serves God and, and serves other people. It's not only the tipping point for you and me, but it, it's a tipping point for a world out there world that needs to know who Jesus is. Is that life? Is that alive in you this day? The disciples began to understand, not while it was going on, but while looking back, what this day meant. That this day, this day where, where Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, with the crowds around him, that this, this let them know that Jesus had power over death, that Jesus had power through life. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, it let them know that Jesus had power, a power of peace, a power of peace. Jesus rode in on a donkey, not a stallion, and even as he rode in, they were calling out to a different kind of power, the kind of power of a force that a king has. And, and there was his army, as many as over two million pilgrims crowded in Jerusalem. His army was gathered around him, an army that recognized him by name, an army that recognized him by face, and an army now that even recognized him by smell. But Jesus didn't call for the kind of power that divides us and them and let's go into battle. No, when Jesus rose from the grave, John chapter 20 says he, he met his disciples behind closed doors, that the doors were closed for fear. And his first words to those disciples on the, the day that he rose from the grave was, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Rollo May wrote a little book called My Quest for Beauty. In this little book, he, he talks about visiting Mount Athos in, in Greece. And Mount Athos is a, is a small peninsula that's totally inhabited by Greek Orthodox monks. Well, there, Rollo May was recovering from, from a nervous breakdown. He was there during the Greek Orthodox Easter that's full of, of beauty, of pageantry, of symbolism, of icons. And at the height of the service, the Greek Orthodox priest gave each person in attendance three beautifully decorated Easter eggs. And when he unveiled the eggs, the priest said in Greek, Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. And then each person together, they, they all responded as a group. He is risen indeed. And Rolome responded with them. He is risen indeed, which is a curious thing. Because Rollo May wasn't a believer at the time. And this is what Rollo May says in his book. He says, I was seized then by a moment of spiritual reality. What would it mean for our world if he had truly risen? What would it mean for our world if he had truly risen? The answer is it would mean Peace. Peace. 
that Jesus, on the last night of his earthly life, he turned to his disciples and he said, Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And the first words to his disciples were, Peace be with you. What would it mean? What does it mean that Jesus has risen from the grave? It means that, that you and I have peace. We no longer have, have reason to fear that the power of the risen Christ just isn't seated in heaven. He's seated through His Holy Spirit in our hearts as well. And we have peace. The most natural thing in the world, it's fear. And that's what this world knows because again and again and again, each time we turn on the TV, each time we turn on a radio, each time we look at a, a notice on our phone, it reminds us to be afraid, to be very afraid. It's natural to be afraid. But Jesus didn't come just so we would do what comes natural. Jesus came to offer you and me a peace, a peace that, that can't, can't come from anywhere else. It's a peace. That, the way that Paul puts it, uh, that it passes all our comprehension. That Jesus is the one that guards our hearts and our minds. And that's a peace that's available to you and to me today. Now, so often we tend to see the Christian life as a smorgasbord. And that of the things Jesus offers, yeah, I'll take some of that peace. Just give me a little bit of that. And we leave behind the things we don't want so much. That's not what Jesus offers. Just a little tidbit here or a good piece of knowledge there or a little bit of understanding or, oh, I, I need a little bit of peace, a little comfort. I'll take that and you can take the rest. No. What he offers is life. And he offers it when we give the whole of our lives to him. Not just a little piece here or a little piece there. Or not just enough to get what we want. It's a life. Heart. Soul, mind, and strength is the way that Jesus puts it. In service to him. In service to neighbor. This morning, it may be that there are parts of your life that you've tried to keep walled off. Maybe like those disciples behind, behind closed doors. It may be that worry that fear that you've, you've, you've tried to section off from him and you've tried to keep away from him. And this morning, his spirit is giving you a nudge. It's giving you a push that you've tried to, to keep from him a part of your life. And this morning, you know that won't do. This morning, I want to pray with you. Right now, join with me in prayer. Jesus, you came not to offer us a smorgasbord. You came to offer us life, full and abundant. You came to offer us power, power through life, power over death, and the power of peace. But this offer isn't given to us as a smorgasbord. It's given as we give our lives to you. You make us into a new creation. But Lord, we need your strength to do that. To give heart. To give soul. To give mind and strength to you. And to give ourselves in service to our neighbor. Lord, we need the power of your spirit to do just that. Breathe on us that kind of strength. This morning there... There may be folks listening that have tried to withhold maybe some worry, a worry that we can call mine. Or it may be a behavior 
a behavior that we've tried to hold back and say, you know, you can have other parts, but this behavior we'd like to call mine. Or it may be we've tried to withhold part of our life and say, well, we can forgive people one thing, but this is one thing we could never forgive. And we've, we've been holding back a, a little part of our lives from forgiving others. You have power we don't have, and that's the power I ask you to breathe on us this morning. It's in Christ's name that we pray. May new life start, begin this day, full and abundant. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.